So you turn on the news. Do you still do that? Scary, isn't it? You watch the news and you see other countries not getting along with countries. You see our country not getting along with itself. Yeah. You look into the court system, you'll see neighbors quarreling, jealousy, animosity, rage, employers and employees in litigation, petitions and petitioners, lawsuits and countersuits, family court, divorce court, property settlements, custody battles, Life is like a giant Jerry Springer show. It really is. And there's trouble lurking around every corner. So there needs to be, there must be one safe place for us to go. A place that is free from this kind of corruption. A place that is free from the evil of this, of this world. And that's, that's the church, right? A place where we go and we know that we will be loved. A place that we can trust. We're going to be honored. We're going to be respected. A place where nobody is judging you. No one is jealous of you. No one is talking smack about you. Nobody's going to ever let you down. Gossip free. Scandal free. Drama free. Oh, a preacher can dream. That's the kind of church that God has purposed us to be. A safe place. The real church. And for us to accomplish this lofty goal in these times that we live in, we've got to start thinking the way Christ needs us to think as the church and ultimately as his ambassadors, Christians. Churches can be a scary place when things get out of control. When people in the church behave like the rest of the world, that's a very conflicting message. Wouldn't you agree? You know, my wife and I, a long, long time ago, when your, when your worship pastor was four years old and his sister was two, we, we bought our first brand new home in Southern California. We were so proud of that little house and we began to attend on a regular basis a little uh, Baptist church just down the street. And that was our first real church experience as a family. And I don't discuss it very often because, quite frankly, that was our first real church disappointment as well. Now, the pastor was a, was, a, was a great guy, and I admired him a lot. He was a man's man, and I just found myself wanting to listen to him, the kind of preacher that I strive to be. And his, his, his son and his new wife were partners with the pastor and his wife, and they owned a, a local landscaping company that the son ran with the family's name. And they advertised their business largely within the congregation. And one day, the senior pastor came to visit our new house, and uh, I, was, I was blessed to have him come see us, and he asked us to do him a favor. He asked us to mentor his son and his new daughter-in-law, because we were older and had a little bit more experience in life, and he thought that we could be a good influence on his kids. And we were honored, and we agreed, and we had them over for dinners and, and board games. We built a relationship. Now, now back to our little house. We're fixing it up. We're, we're adding things onto it, a porch and a hot tub, and we're, we're landscaping. We're putting in trees and, and hedges and, 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 and turf and water irrigation systems and we we're quite proud of our handiwork, but our family business took us back to Colorado for three months every summer, which meant I needed somebody to take care of our property and look after it and mow the lawn while we're gone. And, and the pastor's son said, well, of course you're going to hire us. Our slogan is, a name you can trust. It's right there on the side of my truck. It's right there on, on the business card. And I said, but I've got one problem hiring you. Because we're friends, I keep hearing the problems you're having with your employees. He had employed a crew of, of illegal immigrants, and some of the guys that he employed were, 
were actually criminals. And I know for a fact that he was bailing this one guy out of jail repeatedly to getting back on the job. And I said, with all due respect, if these guys realize that I'm gone for three months, they're going to rob this house blind. He's, oh, no, no. I give you my word. If you'll give me this account, I promise to take care of it personally. I'll be the only person ever to work at your home. Hey, pastor, pastor, son, name I can trust, friends from church, what could go wrong? So I gave him the account, and I wasn't gone six weeks until I received the news that our house had been completely ransacked, and we were robbed of every little thing we had ever owned in our young marriage, including things from our, from our, our childhoods, our, my first BB gun and her sewing machine from her parents, and everything that mattered to us was gone. And it turns out that my young friend sent his employees in his place to take care of our home. And it took them no time to realize that nothing was moving, nobody was coming or going. And they took out an entire window and, and removed every piece of furniture, everything that we owned. Was, they had plenty of time. Now my brother, who's your head of security here in this church, was, he's the next cop, and my dad's the next cop. And these two guys, they, they solved the case quite quickly. And they took the police right to the apartment where these two landscapers lived. And they went inside and they found a lot of our belongings that were not sold yet, including uh, race car jackets with my name stitched on the pocket inside. So those two guys, the landscapers, went to prison for many, many years. And the owner and his son, they just hired more guys and kept on sending them to other people's homes. And so I'm in Colorado, a thousand miles away, and I, we don't text. There's no smartphones. I wrote a letter the old-fashioned way, and I wrote to the senior pastor. I said, with all due respect, I'm new to Christ. I'm new to the church. I, I'm just a baby here, but this seems wrong somehow, that you guys are advertising your business from within the church, and you're hiring people that we can't trust. Case in point, my house was entirely robbed. And I just think it's wrong and you guys should make an adjustment in your business practices. It's not fair to your congregation. Did I get a response? No. A phone call, a visit, a letter, and re no, nothing. Nothing ever came. In fact, when I returned to California a couple months later, I walked into a restaurant in this small town and there was the entire family. And they got up and they left. Like we were the scourge of the earth. So I never attended that church again. That's how fast the bad practices of this world can find themselves in ministry inside of a church and give a young family in Christ a very wrong impression. I thank God that I'm not that easily dissuaded. We can't be that kind of a church. We must be a church that agrees to no longer follow the patterns of this polluted world. and We must decide to be different. We need to look different. We need to behave different. We need to respond to, to situations that might cause us anger or grief differently. God expects better from us. Amen? We can't be like the rest of the world and call ourselves the body of Christ. That won't stand any longer. Now, is that pastor and his family, are they bad people? No, they're good people. Are my wife and I bad people? I don't think so. It's just one of those things where a bad communication, when, 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 when poor choices were made, that got out of control. And that happens in churches. That happens in church families. That happens in our personal families. Now, I'm not targeting anybody, and as far as I know, things are fine here in Crossroads land, but God placed this message on my heart that we must strive to be different. We need to grow up, church. We need to be different about how we handle trouble. You see, there's been trouble from the first family on earth. Think about it. From, from Adam and Eve and their boys, the first family we find the first murder over the first case of jealousy. Now, Jesus said this in Matthew 18, 20. He said, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. But every time two or three gather, <laughs> there's trouble. Because we're not seeking Jesus in our midst. Amen? There's family feuds. There's church splits. There's dissension in the body. 
Oh, pastor. I used to have this associate pastor back in Texas, and his wife would always say, oh, pastor, don't worry about a thing. We've always got your back. What I should have said was, well, you've got my back. Why don't you pull out the knife you've just put there? Because behind the scenes, they're trying to take my job. And God exposed them. There's always this, this, this corporate America world trying to pollute the sanctity of God's house, of God's people. And we must decide that from this moment forward, we're going to handle disputes and difficulties not like the rest of the world. Now, it's hard. I've got a lot of Italian blood in my, in my body. I've got a temper, and I've seen things a certain way for a long, long time. It's not easy making these changes, but well worth it. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with each other on what you say, there be no divisions among you, that you are perfectly united. Now, God's not saying we should all wear our hair the exact same way, although I do think you would look nice. He's not saying we should all eat the same foods, but you would like tamales. He's not talking about our personal choices. We're not being called to be clones or sheep of that sort. What he's talking about is how we agree on him, how we agree on his word, how we agree to disagree, how we serve and settle in disputes and infractions within the body. We do things in agreement that God's word is perfect. His word has the solution for every difficulty that you're being faced with right now. If both parties or all parties involved in every dispute would apply the word of God to the situation, it would be the end of said dispute. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I, I talked like a child. I, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But now, church, we've become mature adults in Jesus. We are done with the childish ways, and we've put them aside. We must do this. We must agree that it's time to truly grow up. It's my great charge as your pastor to keep encouraging us, beginning with me, to continue growing, to keep maturing. If you think that you're mature enough in Jesus Christ, that thought in itself proves that you're immature. Because until the Lord reclaims us and comes back or we meet him, we're not finished. We have work to do. We have changes, good changes to make. Amen? Think about it. Listen to your inner dialogue. When somebody hurts you or, or says things, are, are your feelings hurt? Are you throwing a tantrum like that of a child? We need to die to these childish ways. You see, true change equals truth plus grace plus time. And I've often said that wisdom minus time is not wise at all, because we all learn, if we choose to, from our mistakes. We all grow when we choose to apply the Word of God to our situation, good, bad, and indifferent. I've learned so much from the mistakes that I've made because I have chosen to learn. I have chosen to be changed. I've chosen to apply the Word of God to the errors that I make. So must we all. We need to learn to love each other well. You see, true love always includes honor and respect. If you tell your spouse that I love you, but you fail to show honor and respect, it is not love at all. It is lip service because true, genuine love always includes honor and respect. We must show this kind of love, this kind of honor, this kind of respect for people even when we disagree. That's the charge. That's the call of the Christian. I like the writings of Peter Scazzaro quite a lot. In fact, he, he wrote these three simple points that help us get along. I'd like to bring those into this conversation right now. I'd like to see this church continue living a largely drama-free life. How about you? Point number one. Are you ready? Help you get along. 
Stop making assumptions. Stop assuming things. Luke 6, 37. The word says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it's going to come back on you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. And I've met many folks who believe that they're saved, harboring resentment and unrepented bitterness towards somebody who did them wrong and they think they can somehow justify that ill will, but in Jesus Christ, we can't. Now, I'm not suggesting you get back into a dangerous relationship, but you can release, you can forgive from afar. Yes? You see, when we believe that our assumptions are true, we make mistakes. We, we cause errors. When we believe our assumptions are true, we make the wrong choices based on those false assumptions. We need to learn to ask questions, better questions, not tricky gotcha questions, but sincere questions like, what did you mean when you said that just now? I'm not sure I'm understanding what, what you want me to know about this, this matter. I, I really think that texting is the devil. What did you mean with that emoji? Why is that emoji sweating like that? Why is his tongue sticking out? Why is that heart split in half? What are you trying to say? Why did you send me the picture of a beer stein? What is that? What's the message in that? You can't understand somebody's personality clearly through a text. You can't hear the tone in their voice. You can't see their countenance. You're just making assumptions based on what you're reading between the emojis. It's dangerous. You need to solve disputes and differences the old-fashioned way, by talking one to the other. And if they won't listen, bring someone from the church the godly way. There's a godly way to solve and serve in these kinds of future disputes. If you're going to assume, assume this. Assume that you do not fully understand the situation. Assume that your assumption may be wrong. Try assuming that next time. Point number two. Do not take things personally. Everything hurts our feelings these days. Oh, that just got to me. The pastor, he didn't shake my hand last night. Well, you know what? I didn't shake a lot of hands last night. There was no disrespect. I'm a germaphobe. <laughs> I'd rather hug you than shake your hand. We take care of my elderly parents, and the last time, the last two times I, I caught the flu, my father almost died. And so there's a reason sometimes I, I do things that I do, and I'm not ever meaning to show disrespect, but that's just an example. What's going on in the person's life? Don't assume that you know what's happening. They might be having the worst day of their lives. Perhaps they've lost a loved one. Perhaps they're having trouble with their marriage. Perhaps, perhaps they just lost their job, and you're assuming that it's about you. You can't take everything so personally. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. In other words, you can't trust what you see. My, my mentor and friend, Dr. Smalley, I told you this story countless times, but back in the early days of my ministry, when other ministers and people in the church would upset me, I go to the doctor of psychology, my mentor, Smalley, and I say, can you believe this guy just did this. Can you believe I got this letter in the mail? Can you believe? And he'd say, whoa. He always said, whoa. I wonder, he would say to me, what happened to them when they were four years old that's causing them to act this way? Because it's not about you, Tim. It's something wrong inside of them, and you should have compassion for their plight. And when you start realizing it's not always you, you see, we can build up immunity to the poisons that come and the toxins that come at us from other people when we finally realize and get this right, not everyone is always going to like us. And that's okay. We don't have to defend ourselves. And that's okay. We don't have to win or be right. The Holy Spirit wants you to hear this right now. You don't have to win. 
Our job is to help others to win. Amen? You know, when I was ordained 20-some years ago, I'll never forget it. I was so honored to go through the ceremony. I got this nice framed diploma, and I got this beautiful uh, wrapped Bible with my name engraved as a pastor on the cover for the very first time, Pastor Tim Hill. It was a big moment for me. And I opened the cover, and there's a handwritten letter from my then senior pastor. I was so blessed that he wrote me a personal note inside until I read it. I didn't like what he wrote. Congratulations, Pastor Tim, on your ordination. Now you will never win again. What? What kind of a thing? What have I, what have I agreed to here? I'm a fighter. I'm a winner. I always find a way to win. What do you mean I can't ever win again? But 20 years later, I just told one of our associate pastors this week the exact same thing. We don't win like the rest of the world. We don't fight like the rest of the world. We win better. We are vindicated. We shine like the noonday sun because we do what is right in the eyes of our Christ. Amen? I know who I am. I do not need approval. If you can say that, your feelings will not get hurt so quickly ever again. In fact, here's where I'm going with my belief. I serve an audience of one. If I keep my audience of one pleased with me, all the rest of my life is going to work out. And so will yours. We serve an audience of one. His approval is all that I need. A different pastor taught me years ago, and I, I just still live by these words, stop trying to defend yourself. Stop trying to make yourself look good or, or make yourself look right. Just serve God and let Jesus champion your reputation for you. I've never heard wiser words spoken over this proud, arrogant man that God called to preach. I can't win these fights. In fact, I'm 57 years old, and at this point, I've decided that every time I engage in an earthly, worldly battle, I suffer the most. I'm upset. My system's thrown off. I can't think right. I can't praise. I can't preach right. This things they eat away at me for weeks, months sometimes. And I've come to the place where I realize that by just spewing poison in return in exchange for poison, I'm not better. I'm worse. It's hurting me physically. It's hurting, like, hurting me mentally. It's hurting me, me spiritually. And it's the same truth for you. We don't fight like the rest of the world. I was with Kenneth Copeland in person in Branson, and he was right in front of me, and I heard him say these words. He said, I don't read the press. I don't read the letters sent to my ministry. I don't watch the news about me. As far as I know, everyone loves me. That's wisdom. I've quit reading all of my mail. We now use bomb-sniffing dogs for that. <laughs> you need to decide whose opinion truly matters to you because when you stop taking things so personally, you'll find a remedy to getting along better, I promise you. And finally, point number three, this is a work in progress for me. Practice speaking clearly and listening fully. Practice speaking clearly and listening fully. James 1.19, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all, that includes all of us, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. You see, love is again translated through our respect and honor. We must show love by respecting and honoring other people. And everything really comes down to how we choose to communicate. When we have married couples come visit us that, that are having uh, issues, it always comes down to lack of communication. It might involve sex or money or other things, but it always comes down ultimately to they were not communicating properly about all these other things. And that's true in any relationship. Honest to goodness, straightforward, kind communication can accomplish much. Amen? People don't care how you feel about them. They care about how you treat them. 
Your actions truly speak louder than words. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the Lord, do the right thing, and God will champion the truth for you. Humble yourself. You see, living well in Jesus Christ requires humility. Apart from humility, none of this is ever going to work. To get along well with others requires humility. To hear that small, still voice from God requires humility because here's what's wrong with my flesh. Sometimes I get angry at the way somebody said or did something that involves me and my flesh wants to recoil. My flesh wants to fight back. And the Holy Spirit's warning me, but I'm ignoring God because I want to satisfy the desires of my flesh and be mad first and then deal with it later like Peter, right? That's not wisdom. That's not godly behavior. Those are childish ways that we must lay aside. We must listen in humility for that small, still voice giving us God's remedy, giving us God's resolution to every difficulty that we are facing. I'll say it like this. Are you ready? Stop treating God like the naked guy in the gym. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you. I've been going to gyms since I was 18 years old. Been visiting gyms. I've owned several gyms. And in every gym, in my experience, there's always one weird, naked guy roaming the locker room. Whenever I go there, Dan, he's always in there. He's always in there by the sauna, over by the scale, going to weigh himself completely naked because those shorts might add an ounce. Got to weigh myself, I got to walk, I got to prance around the locker room, showed myself off. I'm afraid to look. I'm afraid to engage in a conversation. It might be misunderstood. I'm looking up. I'm washing my hands. I'm trying to get in and out as fast as I can. And this guy's always walking. Every gym, there's always one. In the sauna, outside the sauna, by the scale. Proud of how they look. I'm just curious at what age we become exhibitionists. What age does the guy say, hey, check this out. I'm thinking, you belong in the Smithsonian. Over by the over by the dinosaur exhibit. Why are you doing this to me? Well, finally it happened. I was in Fort Worth, Texas, and I preached there for five and a half years, and I went to the LA Fitness that was just one block from the church, and sure enough, same time every day, weird naked guy in the locker room. I'm in and out quick, avoiding any eye contact, avoiding any conversation. But one Friday afternoon, I walk in there. The gym is very slow. The locker room is very slow. My, my, my son was not with me this day. It's just me alone in the locker room. And there he is, the strange, old, naked guy. Just me and him. I ignored him, ran to the sink, washed my hands as fast as I could. And much to my, much, much to my dismay, I see in the mirror him walking up behind me and just standing there. Oh, no. I'm getting angry. He just keeps staring at me. I'm getting, I'm getting mad. I'm thinking, how's this going to go? Am I going to wind up in a fight with this naked old guy? But how's that, how does that look? Let me tell you, you can't win a fight with a naked person. I don't like talking to naked people. Unless you are my wife, we're not having a conversation without clothes. I promise you. That's just the rule. I went to the doctor recently. True story. My urologist, if you must pry. My pants are gone, and he's trying to have a conversation. Well, how's the church doing? I said, you know what, doctor? We're not having this conversation until my britches are back up. True story. I said that to the man. I said, we're not talking like this. We're not talking naked. It's against my rules. Now, this guy is behind me wanting to just stare, and I'm thinking, where does this go? How do you end this peacefully? What happens next? Then he spoke. Oh, no. He said, excuse me. Would you hand me a paper towel? Come on, man. There's, there's a paper towel dispenser just three feet to the left. Why do you want my paper towel dispenser? And I just, I just froze, trying to get myself dried off and just get out of the bathroom. And excuse me, sir, can I, can I please have a, a paper towel? What would you have done? The Bible says if a man asks for your cloak, you should give him your tunic. If he asked for my jacket, I would have given it to him. 
he needed something. But I chose to pretend like I was deaf. This is a totally true story. I pretended to be deaf. And I dried my hands, and I walked off like I never heard a thing. And I got in my car, and I was driving home about 30 miles to our house, and I began to feel convicted. I started to feel ashamed. The church where I'm the senior pastor was one block from the gym. What if that man knew that? What if he had been to the church? What if he belonged to my congregation, but I didn't recognize the guy without his clothes on? How do you know? And I'm feeling ashamed. Then I thought, what if he's mentally handicapped? What a, what a jerk I am. I'm an absolute first-class jerk for this. And I'm, I'm praying to God, would you please forgive me? And the Holy Spirit, clear as a bell, spoke into me. Tim, you treat me the same way you treat the guy without clothing in the gym. You see me. You know that I'm there. I'm speaking, but you pretend not to hear me. Ooh, man. So my word for the day is, and you'll never, ever forget this, don't treat God like the naked man in the gym. Words to live by. God deserves better. His word says to submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The closer we come to God... The more we listen to his still, sometimes not so still voice and apply his wisdom to our situations, the better we're going to get along. We must agree to stop allowing our flesh to dictate the conversation, to pause, to pray, to seek the word of God, and to apply God's truth to every single circumstance. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this crazy word. We thank you for principles to help us get along and live better. Help us, Holy Spirit, apply your wisdom to every arrangement, to every agreement and disagreement that we will have from this moment forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So church, I say, I love you. Apply these truths to your situations and keep your pants up. You're welcome and you're dismissed. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed watching that message as much as I enjoyed preaching it. If you want to see more things like this, well, well, like it and subscribe to our channel. Meanwhile, we've placed a link in our description that'll take you right to Crossroads website to learn more fun facts about this fun-filled ministry. God bless you. We'll see you soon.